Thank you very much, and especially thanks to the Wing Foundation for bringing me over here. It's, uh, it's been a great opportunity for me as well, and to see Tracy again and to learn more about all the great work that she's doing here. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I lived in Hong Kong for 14 years. Uh, for the last seven of those, I worked for WWF and uh, started up the marine program. So it's been lovely to meet Patrick here as well. Um, I left Hong Kong in 97, nothing to do with a handover, um, but it was time to go. And um, I worked for the BBC Natural History Unit. Um, I did 12 years with them, initially starting with the Blue Planet series. I kind of cut my teeth on that. Um, one of the things I found very disappointing about Blue Planet was that it only showed the good stuff and looking as if the oceans are really clean and full of fish. Um, some of those sequences, we might have been out on the ocean for, I don't know, five, six weeks to get two minutes of footage. So just, just to give you some idea of what it was like. We were supposed to do a six-part marine environmental series to go with it. Um, but Discovery decided that Americans aren't interested in conservation, therefore they wouldn't help fund it and we couldn't do it on our own. So we just ended up doing one program called Deep Trouble. And even that wasn't global, it was only shown in the UK. So after 12 years at the BBC, I was kind of getting a little bit, uh, what's the word? I wasn't too happy with the way they were ignoring the environment. Every program I worked on, I tried to get some environmental message in there. And often that was taken out by the series producer at the final stages of the edit. So with my background in marine conservation and in filming, um, I was looking for another project to do that might actually use both of these. And was in Hong Kong six years ago as I often am, and um, met somebody here who started talking about the so-called Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, at that time, it was portrayed as this massive continent of plastic 10 meters deep. And there was an expedition going out there in 2009, along with a fleet of fishing boats and apparently a large vessel that was going to turn all the plastic back into diesel fuel. Fishing boats would then collect the plastic, give it to the vessel, turn it into diesel, and continue to get rid of this massive continent of plastic. It sounded too good to be true, and like things often are when they sound too good to be true, that was not the case at all. So what I'm going to do now is talk you through um, the last six years very, very briefly, how much I've learned about this, um, the documentary film that I'm making, and I'll end up by showing you a 10-minute trailer of that film which will just give you an insight into some of the sequences that we're going to have there. I'm also going to talk about some of the solutions. The thing with this plastics problem is that it can be solved and it could actually be turned around within a generation. I'm not saying we could clean everything up within a generation, but we could turn the problem around. People just need to know about it. And I do a lot of talks, and I know Tracy does as well, and perhaps other people here, maybe WWF, will talk to people. And you can turn people's lives around. Maybe if you talk to 100 people, two or three of them will take up the, the message. But to me, nothing actually portrays a message like a, a good visual image. And that's why I think this film's so important. Um, it's been a very difficult one to raise funds for. It took two years before we could even start filming. Um, I've so far raised 1.3 million pounds. Um, we've got a little bit more coming in, so we're now going to complete the film. But um, I'm still looking for more money for the distribution of the film because we want this to go everywhere. So <clears throat> what I don't want to do is repeat everything Tracy said because in my overview, I didn't realize quite how global um, Tracy's experience was. So I will go... Uh, is everybody here? Were you all at Tracy's talk? Is anybody not at Tracy's talk earlier? Okay, I'll go, I'll go pretty quickly then. What I do want you to know is that I'm not anti-plastic. I think plastic is the most amazing um, substance that's ever been built. Look at us all sitting on our plastic seats. <laughs> and you try and go a day without it, you'll find it very difficult. Even single-use plastic has um, incredible benefits. Um, this little baby was born three months too soon. Um, she was actually born into a plastic bag to protect her from um, infection. She had, she had breathing apparatus that was made of plastic. She was fed straight into a vein from her foot right into her heart and she constantly had antibiotics pumped into her through plastic tubes all of which were thrown away and that to me is probably the best use of single-use plastic she's fine now she's my granddaughter um, also plastic heart valves in medicine 
you really can't fault plastic. The problem I have with it is a so-called single use that, that Tracy's talked about. And this has all stemmed from something that we were told a long time ago, and that's that plastic is disposable. And this was the cover of Life magazine sometime in the 50s. You never have to wash up again. Nobody actually thought about you know, what, what we do with it, and we've grown up with it. All of us, you know, Tracy was talking about matches earlier. You can still get them in the UK if you want me to bring you some. Actually, I can't bring them on a plane. <laughs> but it's, it's this, this, these lies that we were told that we later find out about. What about this one? Your doctor's telling you to, uh, to smoke cigarettes. We realize now the, the folly of that one. And other drugs, thalidomide that was given to people who were pregnant for, for um, morning sickness. So now we need to recognize the fact that they were wrong to tell us that plastic is disposable. Where's the way? We've been through this. Um, lots of um, places, we're lucky enough to live in one where plastic is actually taken away from our doors. In many countries, many developing countries, rivers are seen as ever replenishing ways to remove the plastics from the neighborhood. And these kids have never even seen a clean place. This. Um, Turtle, you may have seen this picture. Has anyone any idea what happened to it, how it got to be in that situation? She's called Mae West. She, as a hatchling, went into one of these rings, the top from a, from a drinking bottle. And she, uh, as she grew, you can see what happened to her. I think I've got the x-ray here as well. She was actually in two halves. The shell didn't form underneath the, the ring itself. And if, if you were to pick her up, which you wouldn't because she bites like crazy, but she actually moves in, in two halves. When they took the, the ring off, um, they've since um, fed her with a lot of bone meal and, and calcium-rich food. She has uh, laid a shell down after that. She's okay. She's now about 30. Um, but she can't be released back into the wild, and she's much smaller than other snapping turtles. But as I said, she's, she's feisty. This one I find very difficult. Most animals are looking for food a lot of the time. And, and I, don't know what, I don't know the fate of this one. I'd like to think that whoever took the picture was able to catch it and, and release the plastic from it. But I think what, what I find so um, difficult to look at in this is the way it's over its eye and its wings. So it's kind of, it's trapped forever in that plastic bag and there's nothing it can do and it can't even see properly. Tracy talked about turtles. This is a nesting beach in Indonesia two weeks before the turtles are due to come up. Uh, if the mother turtle is able to dig through all the plastic to lay a nest and, and, and to lay her eggs, that's one thing. But what about the hatchlings? Because they've got to fight their way through it all. The other thing about turtles, which you may or may not know, is that in the egg chamber, the, the temperature of the eggs um, dictates whether they're males or females. So the ones at the bottom, the coolest ones, uh, are, the, are, the are the men, <laughs> are the male turtles, and the, um, the ones at the top are the females. So plastic is a very good insulator. So how is this skewing the, the sex ratio of these turtles if they've already got this massive cover over the, over the nests? And yeah, we mentioned the plastic bag thing. Um, a lot of people don't think of fishing gear as being plastic, but uh, polypropylene is much, much stronger and lasts longer than any of the hemp rope that was used before. But this will break up into tiny fibers over time. And fishermen will cut it away as it gets stuck because it's too difficult to bring in and, and, and disentangle. And that will carry on catching marine life and fish forever. This is Strappy, the great white shark, went into a bait band, similar to the turtle. The bait bands are the bait box bands. And, uh, and it, it had the same effect on him. Now this one, if you were to look it up on YouTube, you can actually see this shark stays still and allows a diver to cut the, the band and, and off he goes. I'd like to think that he survived, but it looks like a pretty nasty gash to me. Oh, <laughs> famous hands here holding the nurdles. I won't talk too much about those because you've seen it all. And these albatross. Did anybody not see the stomach contents here? If, do you want me to pass them around or? Yeah? One of them, the, the big one with the big bits shows all different things that have been found in albatross. And the other one is uh, from one single albatross chick. Um, Tracy was talking about the five gyres. She can't see terribly well on this. Um, but it just, it's just an animated version of the, of the um, one that she showed us, just to show you how it will collect plastic pieces from the um, edges of the coast and, and concentrate them in the centers. So I'd mentioned I'd heard about this incredible um, floating continent, a landfill site in the middle of the Pacific. And unfortunately, the way it's been portrayed has actually made people lose interest in it because 
It's supposed to be this 10 meter deep um, thing. There's, there's various statistics that are given here. Disposable nappies that will take 500 years to break down. The problem is we don't know. Plastic's only been around for 150 years. So talking about figures like this can never be accurate. And, and, and talking about this being this massive uh, garbage patch 10 meters deep, three times the size of Spain, this one says. So um, what was the truth? Well, this was taken at the center of the North Pacific Gyre. If you are diving, it's like you're free falling out of a plane. The water looks so clear. But when you get to, and if, if you, this is the um, result of putting a small boat in for one hour. And yes, you are finding big pieces, but those to me look like they've come from ships um, with the, the watertight lids and the filters and so on. What scientists know now is that it takes about 20 years for plastic to get from the coast to the center. And that plastic will break down into these tiny particles. 80% of all the plastic in the ocean has come from the land. Now, what we also know is that in the last 10 years, we've manufactured more plastic than the whole of the previous century. So whatever you're going to find in the center of the North Pacific Gyre is only going to get an awful lot worse before it can ever get better. These are the manta trawls that, that uh, we were using to uh, look at the surface plankton. You can see the net at the back. Oh, have I got a pointy thing here? Oh, yeah, so th this is the surface one. Because we were told that it was 10 meters deep, we also built, whoa, sorry. We also built one that would go um, two meters below it, and virtually everything was in the surface trawl, because, because plastic will float or it sinks. If its density is greater than one, it's gonna sink, otherwise it'll stay on the surface. We first looked at a trawl 400 miles off San Francisco, and we carried on looking closer and closer to the center, until 1,500 miles off San Francisco, every single one was looking like this. And this, to me, is actually much more insidious than if it was a big floating mass, because this, as Tracy was saying, it gets into the food chain at the lowest level, taking all those toxins with it. Unfortunately, it's hard to make, particularly when you're doing a film, to make this look interesting. And this has been one of the challenges, because everyone was expecting these fabulous images of this massive uh, landfill, but of course it's not there at all. So we've had to find different ways to make the film uh, come to light for people. We're obviously concerned about plankton feeders, basking sharks, the ones we get at home, blue whales, and the fish that, uh, that we eat. Tracy had an animation of that. Top predators as well. And of course, we're top predators. So we've got to think about the food that we're eating and where it's come from. Now, um, the toxins that are associated with plastic have been shown to affect human health in a lot of the areas that are on the increase now, such as cancer, diabetes, and other um, autoimmune diseases, um, low sperm count, developmental problems, cognitive development, um, infertility, and so on. So going back to the film, we went to the Mediterranean to film um, fin whales. Uh, there's a biologist there who's been darting them to take little tiny plugs of um, skin and blubber from them. And from that, you can actually tell whether, whether the whales have been consuming plastic. Um, when we went there, the weather was so bad that in the two weeks, all we saw was one fin of one fin whale. And we ended up, in the end, getting the, um, the material from a dolphin, the first ever dolphin biopsy. And you'll see it when I show you the film clip. So don't be too alarmed when you see somebody holding a crossbow and shooting at, at a dolphin. That's what she was doing. But while we were there, we heard about this, dolphin, uh, this <laughs> turtle that had been brought into a turtle rescue station. And this one had been found floating at a very odd angle, sort of with its back end up, and it couldn't dive. So the vet thought that she might have, have um, ingested plastic. And what the, what the gut had done was to, to try and protect the walls of it. It had got this big gas pocket around it. So rather than operate, he fed her a very oil-rich diet, and sure enough, all this plastic came out. So um, they were taking samples from her when we were there, including taking tissue samples from, from her neck, and once again found um, plastic toxins in there as well. This one wasn't quite so lucky. This was when we were filming lab work in Siena. Some fishermen had brought two turtles in that they'd found caught in their nets. So we said, look, would you be able to necropsy them for us? Because we'd be interested to know from a random turtle, are we going to find plastic? And sure enough, right the way through the turtle's gut, there were little pieces. 
Um, we also wanted to see what it was like on the sea floor because if more than half of pla all plastic sinks, what's down there? And uh, we went out with the COMEX crew. Um, we were supposed to go to known debris fields where the plastic is accumulating, but again, we had really bad weather. So we had to just go a little bit offshore where it was still sheltered, and we could only go down to, I think it was 420 meters, something like that. But actually, that was a bit of an experiment, because if we just did a random test, would we find plastic? And as you'll see in the film, sure enough, we did. One of the places we filmed, which I think has got the strongest story, is on the island of Tuvalu. Does anyone know where Tuvalu is? Because I didn't until I went there. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be part of Kiribati, so it's in the middle of the... Um, Pacific. Now, these people got their independence from Kiribati in 1978. Until then, they'd been completely sustainable. So everything they ate, they ate out of coconut husks, they'd catch their own fish and so on. Once they'd got their independence, they started importing goods from Asia and Australasia. And everything they imported, whether it was rice or toys or biscuits, whatever it was, all came wrapped in plastic. And you can see a little necklace of islands like that, where are they going to put it? They have a freshwater lagoon in the center. And that was actually manufactured during the war when MacArthur was doing his, his advance across the Pacific. He would go to some of the islands, dig out the centers, create runways so that the planes could get across. And Tuvalu was one of those. And it was fine because it was collecting rainwater. As sea levels have risen, rainwater started to get uh, brackish. So they had salt in there. So they started disposing of the plastic in there. Um, they also just throw it around the village because they've got nowhere to put it. And this is what it looks like in the village now. They constantly burn it. They have cleanups every now and then where they push it to either end of the island. But there's always something burning. You can always smell it. Now, nobody's done any medical studies there. The family group we were working with, there were 30 of them. And of those 30, six had cancer and two had died previously. And everybody seemed to be just generally ill. Uh, uh, birth rates were down, everything its just had this pall of sort of sickness about it. Now this to me, I see as a glimpse into the future of what the whole world is going to be like if we carry on manufacturing plastic at this rate and throwing it away like we do. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here, which, which is a shame because none of you are, are going to be chucking your plastic out of the car window like so many people do. But I, I think this is a really, really important place for us to look at. Because when I come onto the solutions, I see, I see this island as being a place where we could really make a difference. Um, I mentioned the albatross earlier. This is uh, Dr. Jennifer Lavers, who's doing work on shearwaters, which are beautiful seabirds, fantastic aviators um, that live around the world. And she's been looking at two species in Australia. These are the ones on Lord Howe Island, which you will see in the film. The other ones that we were looking at were on, they were breeding um, on a little island of Tasmania. And the parent birds, a scientist had tagged them to see where they're collecting their food from. And exclusively, these birds are going from Tasmania all the way down to the polar front, and that's where they're collecting everything. So they go straight down there, feed there, pick up the food for the, for the um, chicks, <coughs> and, and, uh, and, and bring it back. Every year, the aboriginals harvest these birds. They call them mutton birds. And they harvest the chicks and eat them. And they get a window of about, I don't know, I think it's something like six weeks, maybe more. If anyone knows, put me right. Um, and what they'll do is they, they go to a particular island where they've got a, li a license to kill. They, they shake the chicks out of their nest, break the necks, and they go into harvesting sheds. So they go in as fluffy chicks. They come out looking like oven-ready chickens. Well, being the film crew with our, our glamorous job, we were in the gut buckets taking the intestines out and opening the stomachs to see what was in there. We looked at 100 stomachs, and bear in mind the parents have picked up the food that they feed their chicks from Antarctica. 100 stomachs, 100 stomachs had nurdles in, pre-production plastic pellets. So we know that those were collected in, in Antarctica, and that's what they were feeding their chicks with. There wasn't, there wasn't a single one that didn't have them in. And that's frightening. When you think of pristine areas, I'm going to go quickly through that one. So what can we do? And I'll come on to some of the solutions. In the, in the film, you'll only see one solution. People always say to me, what can we do, particularly when I talk to school kids. So I'll, t I'll start with the simple ones, and it's all the ones that we know. Drinking straws. This one really gets me. I say to the kids, what age were you when you stopped drinking from a sippy cup and learned how to drink out of a, out of a glass? And they're going, oh, 
I think I was two, and you know, this sort of thing. And I'm saying, well, why do you need straws? And it's not just the kids. We have cocktails, and sometimes they put two straws in one cocktail, and one is pointing downwards. That, to me, is the most ridiculous use of a disposable plastic. And I often forget to ask to not give me a straw, and then I, when I forget, I get so cross with myself. What makes it worse is a lot of the time they use black plastic straws. Black plastic can't even be recycled because recycling is sorted through a light reflection and the black doesn't reflect it. So the only thing you can do with that is incinerate it or bury it. So if anyone asks you what they can do, one thing they can do, ask to not have a straw. Although it doesn't always work, does it, Tracy? <laughs> this is one that's really getting me, balloon releases. When you think about it, 70% of our planet is ocean. The chances are these are going to land in, in the sea. This is one I picked up off the beach. These things that they put in them, the, the balloon ties or the bits that stop it, the air coming out. I've seen so many of these inside dead chicks, and of course turtles go for them too. Oh, sorry about that. Has it been like that for long? Okay, how oh, weird. Here we go. Um, yeah, some of the things we don't need to use. Polystyrene is one of the worst. It's the hardest to recycle. I've been to many recycling centers because I know how to have a good time. And the one in, uh, there's one in Germany and there's one in Dagenham where they will recycle polystyrene, but most of the time it doesn't get recycled and it's huge. Um, all of this we've been through and everybody here knows this. Beach cleanups, that's another one. Um, I, I think it's fine. Um, I think it's, it's, to me, it's like if you break your arm and your fingers don't work, it's like trying to fix the fingers rather than the break. But it does raise awareness. And also in a lot of countries they'll have beach cleanups, um, and you ask them, where, where, did, where did all the plastic go afterwards? Oh, I don't know, we put it in the bin. So you kind of think, well, it's probably going to end up back there. We do underwater cleanups as well. Um, we're talking about the beads. Here's three pretty well-known ones, and you can actually see how many are in each one. So I'd say certainly don't go for Neutrogena, but actually don't go for any of them. If you look at the ingredients, anything that says, um, uh, what would it say, anything to do with polymers, you'll, you'll know that it's plastic on there. Um, when I talk to kids, what I, what I ask them to do is to save up all the plastic they would have thrown away for a whole week before they come in and bring it in. And that's actually quite a lesson anyway. And then we start to do some artwork. Not quite as good as Mandy's, but I'm sure you can all tell that that is a hammerhead shark, top predator. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the most important things which is going to change this is legislation. Because people that don't care... Can't, still can't break the law. I'm sure they'll try, but they still can't. Now, in, in Germany, in 1991, a new ordinance was brought in whereby all packaging had to be collected to be recycled. And the great thing about it was, was that the levy was put on the people producing it. So it was a producer pays things. Now, I understand from speaking to the person in, in Hong Kong who might be dealing with this, that they're looking at asking the people in the housing estates as a trial to pay to have their recycling taken away and that to me is the worst way round possible if you make the people who are producing it pay for it then they're going to be the ones who will redesign it you don't get packets of biscuits now with extra cellophane on the outside in germany everybody thinks about what they're doing and they have to pay for the recycling at the end so it just makes the manufacturers think you don't get any blister packs it's good stuff um, i'm not going to make you read this and test you on it later unless you'd really like me to um, but this is new work that's been done in America that shows just how quickly um, toxins will be picked up on plastics because the manufacturers will say, the plastic makers will, will say, um, oh, but it's clean plastic. Well, you know, we don't put the toxins on it. it, it it's fine when it, when it goes in the water. But as Tracy was saying, it sucks it in so fast and, and it sticks to it um, until it gets inside our systems. And then, of course, it, it, it likes fat better than it likes plastic. So those toxins will, will sit, sit in the fatty layers, which are the ones we like to eat when we... Uh, when we have our fish. Um, but this, this, what she did was put clean nurdles around uh, San Diego Bay where they collect a lot of the seafood. From day one, she was finding toxins on those. But more than that, she had these fish that they do their experiments on and she fed some of them. She chopped up the clean virgin plastic and she chopped up the most toxic ones. With the clean ones, in the males, they oestrogen receptors went through the roof. They shouldn't even have them. They were higher than the, the females. 
Uh, the females didn't seem to be affected by the clean ones, but with the toxic ones, their levels went right down. So that was only one test that was done, but already she could see endocrine disruption at both levels of the plastic, and I think that's quite important. And what we want to do is encourage more studies like that and raise funds for more research, because governments will, will change legislation when they've got the proof. It's never, ever a precautionary principle, which they all say they're doing. Um, this is another one. Now that we know how toxic plastic becomes in water, what they asked to do, and this was published in Nature magazine, is to get um, governments to recognize that if plastic is hazardous, then <coughs> it should be classified as so. Excuse me one sec. Losing it. Because if it's classified as hazardous, then it has to be prevented from going into the environment, which means that they'll look again at sewage treatment plants, um, they'll look again at fines, and if there is something like Lapsat One, then habitats have to be restored the same way as if there's an oil spill. So we just need to rethink of plastic as hazardous as soon as it hits the water. Oh, and talk to this lot about it. Um, this is at the re recycling center in, in um, Germany. It works very, very efficiently as things do in Germany. It also makes a lot of money um, for the people there, um, for the people that, that, uh, that, are, that are doing the work on it. I don't see recycling as the answer, actually. I see recycling as a last resort. If, if you can't do anything else with it, then at least recycle it. But it has to come after reducing, redesigning, reusing, and refusing. God, I remembered all those. Um, closed loop, loop recycling is, is the best example you can get, and this is when they're actually um, sorting the plastic out uh, right at the beginning before, before they start to um, um, put it through the system. So you're getting all the bottles, all the food processing, all, all the uh, food grade plastics together. So, because if you mix plastic, the minute there's some color in it, if you start mixing them, you know what it's like when you give kids a load of paint. By the time they've mixed it all up, it's always dark brown. And that means that the pellets can only ever be used for garden benches and bird tables and underground water pipes and that kind of thing. So the, the, it, the, it's better, higher quality, and it's more valuable if, it, if it's sorted um, originally. What have I got here? Here we go. Plastic can be made into fuel. Actually, if you make plastic into diesel fuel, it's lower sulfur than the stuff we have at the pumps. Again, I don't see this as the answer because of the problems we have with global warming. But while we're waiting for our solar-powered cars to come out, we could be at least cleaning up the mess and taking the pressure off oil reserves. Um, this is one of the solutions that's been developed in Canada. This is pyrogenesis. What you're seeing there is a plasma torch. The plasma torch would be in a chamber and Plastic, in fact, anything in this room could be fed into it. If you heat plastic up in, in a fire, as they're doing on Tuvalu, you get toxins given off, dioxins and furans, which are known carcinogens. If you superheat it to 5,000 degrees, which a, pl a plasma torch will do, you actually turn it beyond that stage into its original atoms. So if you're putting plastic into the chamber, you're getting carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. What you'll get from that is water and carbon monoxide. And the carbon monoxide they use as a syngas to refuel the system. The US Navy was so impressed by this um, piece of equipment uh, that they've been building an aircraft carrier for the last two years, and it goes into commission this year. The whole of the hull was built around one of these pyrogenesis machines because they've been concerned about how much, plastic, how much waste they're, they're dumping out at sea or getting rid of during exercise. So this way, they don't need to. They've also tried it out in one of the Air Force bases in Florida and were able to put energy back into the grid that was, that was serving the um, houses there. So I see that as a good thing for the future. This is portable. We know it goes in the hold of a ship. You could actually use one of these in Tuvalu to start clearing it up and produce um, fuel for them. Um, but it's, it's expensive at the moment. There, there's prototypes. This is something we need to think about. Another use, I think, because you're limited by the size of the chamber, how much plastic it can take a day, when you go to these recycling centers, as you now know that I do, there's a lot of plastic that they can't turn back into pellets, things that are either too small or they're black. If you had a, a <coughs> pyrogenesis machine as part of that, you could actually get 100% of everything recycled and turned either into energy or into pellets. So um, this one I, I, I like the idea of. It's expensive, though. Um, this is another, another one that can be fit in. It's a, like a smaller version of turning plastic into fuel, and this fits in the hold of a, a ship. So, uh, I'm sorry, one of the car what do you call those cargo ship boxes? Containers. It'll fit in one of those. So these are something that could be taken out to small island communities and perhaps even put it to supermarkets and so on so we can all feed our plastic into them. So there are answers out there. We just need some kind of 
investment into them. And this is another one, STX Multifeed, um, a similar system uh, that uses um, molten uh, metal chamber. And this has been developed in Singapore. I don't know much more about it, and I've been trying to find out more, but I just, I just know that it exists. So the point I'm making is there are solutions out there. None of them is the solution. But we need people to understand the problem. We need them to look at the existing solutions that are out there, make them better, and also test them. Test them on communities. Um, you may have read something about a, a young Dutch guy called Boyan Slat, who's supposed to be clearing up the gyres in the next five years. Um, scientists are rolling their eyes up at this somewhat. Um, I think it's fantastic the um, attention that has been drawn to this, um, but actually, the, there's an awful lot that it doesn't consider. What about the very, very important phytoplankton and zooplankton that's at the base of the food chain? What about the fact that I mentioned earlier, if we've made more plastic in the last 10 years than the whole of the previous century, and that hasn't even reached the centers of the oceans yet, um, it's certainly not going to be cleared up in anything like that. Also, it's going to be anchored in four and a half kilometers. That concerns me as well. And anyone who knows anything about the marine environment would also kind of say what? Anyway, but it's good that, that a lot of attention has been focused on it, and it make, means people do care because they're throwing money at it. Um, I mentioned earlier about beach cleanups. This is, this is kind of, 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 of my thought. It's great to be cleaning up the oceans, and we certainly, it, you know, if we can do it, it's great, but it is like trying to mop up a flood when the tap's still running. So the most important thing is we stop getting it there in the first place, change the focus, do that, and then think about the, you know, the mess at the same time, but not just continue to clear it up. Because if we do, people are still going to think that it's fine to chuck your plastic away because there's always somebody clearing it up. And that's really not, we, not, we want, not the message we want to um, give. Um, I think this the next bit is a, a short clip. I, I interviewed David Attenborough about this, and it, uh, you can see his film on our website. One of the questions that's not in that, I asked him, and uh, you'll see his response, and I think it's really quite an important one. Oh, that's not it. Okay, this is um, <laughs> Method have decided to make bottles from plastic collected from the ocean. And they were showcasing this at a plastics conference I went to in, in New York last year. Um, one of the things they hadn't considered is, yes, they're making it from the oceans, but it's black and it can't be recycled. So if there's too many of them, what happens then? Um, also, the idea of bottles that break down. People sometimes say, what about biodegradable plastic? It's something else that we need to look closely at. It's a solution, but at the moment, we don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. The so-called OXO biodegradables, you have to bury. Um, if you bury them in landfill, they, they need light to break down, and they need oxygen. They're not going to get it at the bottom of a landfill site. Also, if something's going to break down in the ocean, you're, this, this plastic is so good it actually looks like normal plastic, so, and it still breaks up into similar particles. So it's still a problem getting into the food chain. And also, because it looks so good, you put that in with your normal recycling because you don't even realize that then gets made into something like an underground water pipe and eventually starts to get soft and then there's holes in it. So yes, it's a great idea, but we need some proper industrial composting and some way of sorting it before we can say, yay, we've got biodegradable plastics now. Oh, we are making um, a film about this. It's going into the final stages of the edit now. We're still raising funds to perfect it and for the um, distribution. So if anyone is able to pass me on to somebody they think might be able to help, please do. I shall stay around afterwards. Um, this is our, um, our website, um, plasticoceans-hk.org or just plasticoceans.org. We also have a Facebook page. And what I'm going to do now is... Um, make you think about the future. If you look at the world population in 1950 to, to what it's expected to be in 2050, and you look at how much plastic we've been producing, we've really got to do something about it. And I'm so glad that everybody's come here and has sat and listened to all these talks about it, because it shows how keen you are. And the more people that do it, um, the more chances we've got of, of, of helping. So um, Thank you for that. I'll listen to questions later. What I'm going to show you now is a 10-minute trailer from the film. Um, it shows you a couple of the sequences, um, just, just a small portion of it. It's going to be about 85 minutes long. This is 10 minutes. And this only shows one solution, 
which is the recycling. So please understand, in my mind, I see that as, as a last resort. The title is likely to change. That's been a working title the whole time. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Yes. Private foundations. I did actually talk in. Um, I did talk in the Middle East to um, some of the big oil companies there who were producing. In fact, all the plastics for Europe, all the, all the pellets were for Europe. For Europe, and they were very, very interested in it, um, but weren't forthcoming with any money. They wanted me to go talk to all the guys down at the oil fields because they they were just amazed by what was going on, um, but no funding came forward from that. But I don't give up. Thanks very much for your kind of attention. Yes. How much time do you have to get ready for this? All my time. Yes. I'm, I'm, yes. It's been the six year labor of love. Um, sorry. Um, you, you said you went to the oil fields and. Uh, I didn't. I didn't oh, go out oh, there. you no. didn't, but was that invited. was a suggestion. Yes. Um, I, one of my very old friends, who's now in his 70s, has spent a lifetime making money out of plastics. And several years ago, he told me when I first, because I, I do beach cleanups and lots of advocacy work, he told me that when I tried to show him much of the same stuff that is included in that, he didn't really want to see it and he just said, uh, plastic doesn't make pollution, people make pollution. And that was his position. He didn't recycle at that time. All his trash went in one bin, even mm. though the recycle facilities were um, available in Yorkshire, where he lived. He has now started to separate his waste, but I still can't get him. There was a, there's a great um, a video from a girl who went out with, I can't remember her name, but she had parents that worked for National Geographic, and she went to Mauritius. Um, and uh, was looking at the plastic in the ocean and makes a very light-hearted but serious, um, engaging film about this. And I thought, well, well, I'll show him this. He cannot sit and, and look at it. He gets up and he walks upstairs, and if I push him, then there would be a, a confrontation. I, I can understand why it's very uncomfortable, but how do we... Uh, if, if people can't... If it's too uncomfortable for them to deal with, how can we get them engaged in being part of the solution? Yeah, because it is horrific. I mean, it, even when we're, we're dealing with it, it's horrible to see those images. But, yeah, it, it's, but then it's, how, do you get, how do you get over that? And, yeah. and, and it's been a problem that we've had with this film because originally I thought it would be a documentary for BBC Two, which you probably realise is the more educated channel, not mm -hmm. the general audience. And it was a case of, well, we, we, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir, just like I am here. Everybody here cares. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of how, how do you do it? And we looked at things that interest people. Some will be interested already in, in you know, the problems of pollution because it, it's, it's an eyesore. Some will care about the animals, you know, show them a, a, a sweet dolphin and, and they might care. Others would walk away from it. Um, the two that we, we tend to get people to, to think about is um, the money side of it. When we started this, oil prices were still very high. And uh, if, if you hold up a, a plastic bottle, imagine that's a two-litre bottle. It's taken a quarter of that just to manufacture the bottle itself. So every time you, d you buy a plastic bottle, a quarter of its capacity was oil that was used to make that bottle in, in components and energy. So you think, we're burying that, and yet look at the cost of it, look at the price at the pumps, and that starts to make them think, well, you know, it, it is valuable, and it, it's something that we shouldn't be using as a disposable item. So sometimes you can sort of get them in the wallet. But the other one that, uh, that I've found nobody can ignore is the human health side. And we were actually down at the Henry Regatta. Um, we had a, a bit of a stand there, and uh, we're giving out pamphlets. And a lot of the, the guys, particularly the, the young trendies, um, was sort of saying, oh, no, I don't want to do anything. And, and then we were saying, but actually, what we're talking about, this, is, this affects fertility. This can cut fertility by 50%. What? Give me one of those. So people actually start to think about it. You say that to David Attenborough, however, and he's saying, well, that's a good thing, isn't it, Joe? The world population's <laughs> too big anyway. So there's kind of messages that will, will trigger responses from, from different people. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't have the answers. Yeah. But I do think people are very visual mm -hmm. animals. And, and if they can see things, I mean, when I, one of our sponsors is Bristol, 
city because they're green capital of Europe. And the people I originally saw that got interested in this um, have, have since moved away because the whole thing's become a bit commercial. I still hadn't got the money out of them that, that had been promised and there were conditions which we hadn't met. And they said, well, good luck with the new guy that's taken over because he doesn't give a damn. So his opening words to me was, look, Joe, I'm not a greenie. I, I'm you know, really not interested in this kind of thing. I, you know, I was just brought in to do the, the commercial side. And I said, well, you're just the like, kind of challenge that I like, because if I can get you to start thinking about it, then you know, I, I, I know it's being effective. And I showed him the Albatross Summit contents. Somebody still got them, by the way, because they're very valuable to me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and he was absolutely blown away by it. He was showing everyone around the office. He was getting their office photographer in. They were tweeting about it. So something, some, we just hope there's going to be some element of this that will trigger with some people. But human health is something we can't ignore, and particularly when you've got children, because you then care beyond your own life. And a hell of a lot of people have kids. And if you're like me and you have grandchildren, then you, you care even you know, beyond their li the ch your children's lives. So you know, it's, it's, that's probably the hardest hitting thing. He, he'll say he's 70, but I'm sure he's got kids. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> I'll try and keep any more very quite, um, simple. Okay, well, thanks again to the Wing Foundation for giving me this opportunity and to Belinda for organizing it. Thank you very much, Joe. And um, if anyone wants to learn more about uh, Plastic Ocean's work, um, Joe, do you want to give them the details of how to contact you? I have some cards if anybody wants them. I have a business card, yeah. So thank you very much, Joe, for wrapping up our uh, Wing Masters Awards talk series um, with this very important message. And thank you to everyone who took time out on a Sunday afternoon to come to this. Um, and also thanks to our simultaneous interpreters who've been working very hard for these past two days. Thank you.